in Star Wars talks, there's only one place to start, which is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, not actually that long ago, so in the 1980s, uh, phylogenetic comparative methods were first developed um, in order to deal with the sort of statistical uh, non-independence of species when you're doing comparative analyses. Um, so just to point out what that is, in case people are unfamiliar with these methods, essentially when we run um, any kind of really simple analysis, just a regression for example, um, we're making a number of assumptions during parametric statistics, and one of these assumptions we're making is that the data points are independent of one another. The problem is that when we use species as data points, um, they're not independent. So uh, thank you to Thomas for letting me have this picture, although apparently I got the license wrong, because apparently everybody learned yesterday that CCBY is so out of date. Um, but basically, um, when you're looking at a data set like this, this is primate skulls, and all of these primate skulls look kind of similar to one another, but this isn't because they magically evolved those similarities. It's, um, it's because they um, share a common ancestor, and they've evolved from that common ancestor, which is why they have these similar sort of shapes. And so this introduces a statistical problem because it means that these data points are not independent of one another because they've evolved from each other. Uh, okay. Um, this is going to be all the way through, I think. Um, yeah, so they're, they're not completely... Uh, sorry. Too so distracting. Uh, I don't normally use a microphone, so it's awfully confusing. Um, it's not as bad as I went to London recently and they tried to get me to use like a Britney Spears headset thing, which was really horribly wrong. Um, anyway, so statistical problem, things are not independent, so we use phylogenetic comparative methods to deal with this. So the classical ones would be things like uh, phylogenetically independent contrast and PGLS, so phylogenetic generalised these squares. However, since then, these uh, methods have actually expanded a great deal. So they're now used for lots of different things in terms of ecological pattern and process. Um, so things like uh, modeling speciation and extinction, uh, looking at diversification rate changes, and, and also looking at the tempo and mode of evolution. And so this is just showing um, that the popularity of these methods has also sort of increased as more different methods have come out. So this is some data I took from Google Scholar um, last week. And you can see down here, this is 1980 going up to 2015. This is the number of papers that were published each year uh, which feature the term phylogenetic comparative. What you can see is that this has increased a huge amount. We're up to nearly 800 papers a year using these methods. So they're incredibly popular. Loads of really exciting things that you can do with them. Um, so it's a really good time to be a comparative biologist. However, <laughs> the problem is that phylogenetic comparative methods also have a dark side. So thanks to Rich Fitzgerald for this lovely piece of uh, photoshopping. Um, so the dark side is basically that phylogenetic comparative methods are just statistical methods like any other. So they have assumptions, they have biases. So as uh, both Mark and Elena were talking about earlier, there are these problems that people need to be aware of when they're trying to use them. The problem seems to be, though, that as people, have, the more people are using these methods and the methods are getting more complicated, people are becoming less and less aware of those assumptions, which means we're getting all these empirical papers coming out where model fit is really bad, um, and sometimes the results Results have been completely misinterpreted. And this is becoming even more important when we're using these methods, which are kind of pattern-based methods, but we're using them to infer an evolutionary process. So quite often they're used to um, give evidence for things like stabilizing selection or um, phylogenetic conservatism, um, which um, is not actually necessarily what these methods are showing, especially when you're not taking into account the assumptions and the various underlying biases. And of course, this isn't anything new to, to the kind of the community. So Rob Frankleton's paper in 2009 was looking at the seven deadly sins of comparative analysis. So in this paper, he also mentions that the problems just boil down to a lack of appreciation of the underlying assumptions of comparative methods. And then coming at it from a slightly different angle, Jonathan Rosas in 2011 published his paper, uh, Seeing the Forest for the Trees. And his point here was that phylogenies are powerful tools for understanding the past, but like any tool, they have their limitations. So the big point he was trying to make was that people started using phylogenies to answer pretty much any question. The problem is not every question actually lends itself to being answered using a phylogeny or using a phylogenetic comparative method. And equally, not every data set um, lends itself to that. If you don't have that many species, so if you have five species of given, it's probably not much point in running a PGLS analysis on that data. You, you need to really consider what you're doing. Think about what the biological interpretation is going to be of those methods when you actually use them. Um, so, basically all this led to um, a lot of discussions amongst a, a large group of us, and 
these discussions all kept going back to um, sort of why were we seeing this problem? So why are we seeing this increase in misinterpretation and this increase in sort of lack of awareness of the assumptions of these methods? And I think a lot of this, although I'm focusing on comparative methods, actually applies to pretty much any kind of statistical method that's out there. And so the big thing that we thought was probably going on, or one of the things we think is going on here, is that we've got two groups of people involved. So firstly, we have people who are developing new methods. Now, in the original version of this, this was a Wookiee. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't find any uh, non-copyrighted versions of this, uh, so we are getting random clip art animals uh, today. <laughs> so the reason it was Wookiees is because methods developers and statisticians, and I apologise to those of you in the audience, this is just a joke, um, they, that they can't communicate with anybody other than each other and Han Solo. Um, <laughs> And so they're aware of the methods, assumptions, they're aware of the biases, they're aware of the problems, um, but um, they you know, perhaps aren't communicating these very effectively. On the other side, then, we have, and here's a kitten as promised. Um, I can't remember, oh, Laura asked for a kitten. Um, so at the other end of the scale, we've got method users. Um, so I would count myself as a method user. And by the way, I'm not getting at anybody with any of this talk because I make all these mistakes all the time. And I'm just trying hard to make fewer of them. Um, so the idea here is that methods users, some of them may have a lot of awareness of the assumptions, but other people may have just come into this for the first time. So it could be a new graduate student who's just been told to apply a method by their PI, or it could be somebody who's an expert in a different domain, but has been told to apply one of these methods by a reviewer. And of course, most people are going to fall somewhere along this spectrum, so uh, a lot of methods developers are actually developing methods to test particular empirical questions. A lot of methods users will have a lot of knowledge of the systems. Um, so most people are falling somewhere on this these, these sort of um, spectrum. Um, so the issue we think then is these people have all this knowledge, all this information about the assumptions, about the problems uh, with these statistical analyses, but this all this information is not being passed down to the people who are actually using the methods and then misinterpreting the results. So we were trying to think then exactly what's going on here. Why are we seeing this, this issue? So the first thing is, as scientists, we're mostly communicating by the literature. So although we're communicating here today in this way, uh, mostly we're, we're spreading things around by the literature. One of the problems we noticed is when we started looking into this in a, bit more, in a little bit more detail, we found that not everything was actually in the literature. Um, so we refer to this sort of jokingly as, as phylogenetic comparative method folklore because it tends to get passed down to sort of word of mouth from PIs to graduate students and between different groups and occasionally it's closer to fiction than it is to fact. Um, so some examples would be things like uh, package defaults, which is just a random piece of R code to, to illustrate this point. Um, so initially people tend to develop packages or they develop methods and they'll usually have a set of defaults in that package. Over time, however, people tend to start thinking that this is the only way these methods can be applied. So you have to use these defaults. Uh, but generally, these defaults were put in there for, for maybe they were a, the e an easy way of doing it for the, the person who was developing the method, maybe it applied for that data set. Really, they should be a starting point for exploration of your data rather than just um, sort of the, the default way of doing it every time. So over time, these tend to become entrenched in the community even if they weren't in that initially intended to be. Another problem here is that this information is quite often passed about in a really sort of dark manner. So, um, informing a kind of dark advice. Yeah, these are just random pictures. Uh, it's focal. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, quite often, say, a package developer will be emailed by somebody using their package and they'll communicate about some problems and about the best ways of applying these, these uh, methods. However, this forms a kind of dark advice which isn't open to the whole community. Um, even on the RSIG Philo help list, this is really good. However, you quite often um, can't search it very easily, so the same questions come up again and again and again. So this information is sort of floating around, it's just not actually found in the literature. When you actually do look in the literature in a lot more detail, you tend to find that actually um, most of the assumptions and the biases and things like that are mentioned in the literature somewhere. Um, the problem then becomes that actually, although they're in the literature, it can be quite difficult to find them. So the literature can quite often be quite dense and quite technical, and there can be quite a lot of it. So just to give you an example, I really like this paper. I wanted to put up a paper that I really like. However, look at all the equations on this page. So trying to read this makes my eyes bleed. Um, 
But it's really important information that you can't really expect somebody who's really new to a method and perhaps doesn't have the mathematical background to be able to read this paper and get everything they need to out of it if they don't really understand the math that's going on. Another problem is that there's a lot of data. Um, so this is just a really quick um, research bit of research I did looking at uh, the most commonly used um, phylogenetic comparative method, which is independent contracts. And these are all the papers that I needed to read in order to understand the assumptions underlying that method. You can't really expect somebody who's been told to run one of these by a reviewer to go away and sort of read all of this information and understand it. Um, perhaps um, without some sort of help along the way. And then another problem that we found in the literature is that although this important information tends to be there, it's actually sometimes really difficult to locate. So we've been thinking of it as being a little bit like a needle in a haystack, but I couldn't find a non-copyrighted version of a needle, so from now on it's a paper clip in a haystack. <laughs> um, but sometimes assumptions and things are put in the introduction, sometimes they're in the method, sometimes they're in the results, they could be right at the bottom of the discussion, and quite a lot of the time they're sort of dotted throughout the paper, they're not all corralled in one place, which can be a real problem because not only do you have this massive stack of papers to read, you have to read them all really, really carefully to make sure you don't miss anything. And then the final one, which is perhaps a slightly more controversial idea, is that I think sometimes what we're, one of the problems we're seeing, certainly a problem I'm seeing when I'm reviewing papers, is that sometimes people are finding it easier just to jump in and perform the method than, they actually, than to actually go away and read all this literature. Um, so I think part of this is to do with the sort of R revolution. Uh, so back, say, 10 years ago, if you wanted to apply a comparative method, you often had to code it up yourself or use some strange GUI-based package that somebody had written or learn how to use a particular programming language that you perhaps weren't familiar with. And nowadays, um, almost all of these things are written in R, so the community is, is very R-centric. So this is from Bino Mira's Cram task view on, um, on Cram, showing you the cumulative number of R packages on the uh, y-axis here um, that have been published since 2000 up to 2014. And you can see that we're now up to about 80 different packages for applying phylogenetic comparative methods. And this doesn't include stuff that's on GitHub that hasn't been uploaded to Cram. So the problem seems to be that as this has happened, the community has become much more um, sort of au fait with using R, which means it's often easier just to, and I do this all the time as well, <laughs> rather than actually going out and reading lots of papers, instead just taking a package sort of off the shelf and playing around with it um, to, uh, to see if you can get it to work. The problem with this, though, is that quite often you find that R help files and vignettes and things like that don't actually have any information about the assumptions or the biases, even though those things are written in the literature. Um, so just as an example, I mean, the 8th book is a great book. It's a great way of sort of getting familiar with phylogenetic analyses in R. But on the chapter, which is all about um, independent contrast, it doesn't mention any of the underlying assumptions at all, even though they're really well known and they're actually really easy to test in R. Um, so it does sort of exacerbate this problem because people are jumping straight into using the methods. And this is kind of counter to, to Rob Frankleton's prediction in 2009 that R would actually make all of these problems go away. Wait it all. Okay, so uh, I've done a bit of moaning. Um, and it'd be a terrible talk there if I just moaned. Um, so I want to sort of come up with a few vague suggestions of, of solutions uh, potentially to some of these problems. And I think this is a good group of people to talk to this, uh, talk about this too, because I think as a community, it's something that maybe we're all suffering from in whichever sort of branch of science we're working in, and perhaps we can come up with some joint solutions to some of these problems, uh, particularly um, in methods in ecology and evolution. So my first suggestion then is simplifying and summarizing. So we can hardly expect um, people to really understand all of the methods papers which are coming out if they're, if they're completely unintelligible. So there are a couple of things that we can potentially do. I mean, the first and probably the simplest idea would be to at least have somewhere in your paper where you neatly write out all of the assumptions, the caveats, and the biases. Now, admittedly, this can be really difficult. Sometimes there are a lot of hidden biases. Um, sometimes there are a lot of... Um, 
um, extra caveats, and sometimes there are so many caveats that you couldn't possibly list them all. But at least having something like how many species do you need in order to get sufficient power for this method to actually work. Um, so sometimes you see people who have spent a long time trying to get an analysis to work on, say, 50 species, and if they've read the paper and sort of found somewhere hidden in the supplementary material these, these uh, simulations, they find out actually you need about 100 species to really have any power to say anything. Um, another suggestion uh, would be to produce some kind of accompanying material to go along with these. So either videos or podcasts or, or blog posts explaining your method in a slightly more simple terms and also including information on the caveats and limitations in that. So I think Medicine and Ecology and Evolution are doing a great job. Um, there's loads of brilliant um, resources on their webpage um, with podcasts and things like that. Probably my favourite one would be uh, Rich Fitzjohn's video, puppet-based video uh, for diversity. Uh, particularly awesome because this is Sally Otto, you know, MacArthur Genius, Sally Otto, starring as the yellow bird in this. So if you haven't watched this, I definitely recommend going to it. But it's a nice way of sort of uh, explaining what you're trying to do in a slightly simpler fashion. Although we can't all be great puppeteers. <laughs> Another suggestion then is, you know, what do we do with the glut of literature that already exists? So these are ideas for new papers coming out. What do we do with the stuff that's already out there? So one suggestion has been to come up with some kind of wiki-based system where, um, and I know actually the, the BES computational, uh, no, what are they called now? Quantitative ecology, sorry. Uh, the quantitative ecology group are looking into doing this for a whole series of really common statistical methods. So putting up a list of where you would get more information and which papers you should read. So here's another example of that. Uh, this is uh, called Phylobabbles, this is Eric Matson's page, and this is for phylogenetics. And so it's, a, it's what's called a discourse page. And so there are lots of different uh, ideas and things that people are talking about. And these are labelled up with things about software, about practicalities, and then you can have a discussion, and all that information is then freely searchable and available to the community. So there's been the suggestion of doing this as a kind of uh, discussion board for phylogenetic comparative methods, but also as a suggestion of using this to replace our help. Uh, because these things are much more easily searchable and could also replace the emailing back and forth that goes on so that these, this information would be publicly available and available to the community rather than just being sort of dark advice that sort of sits in people's email inboxes. Another suggestion then is to collaborate. Uh, this is perhaps an obvious benefit for methods users, but perhaps less obvious for people who are developing methods. Particularly if we're still going to be in a system where, uh, for things like hiring and promotion, we're really sort of favouring people with first and last author papers. Uh, because if you're going to help somebody run a method, you're probably going to only get a middle author paper out of that. So this is sort of slightly difficult to incentivize, uh, but could be really useful for people creating new software to have somebody to test that software, to find corner cases and bugs and things like that, and also to have new data sets to test um, their models on. Uh, this one is a particular bugbear of mine, um, which I'm sure everyone has heard me argue about in the pub. Um, but I think this is something that we've all sort of got ourselves tangled up in a lot, which is that novel is not always better. So a lot of journals only really want to publish novel methods. So you try and publish um, an improvement to an old method or a critique of an old method or some kind of way of testing the assumptions of that method. And you find it much harder to publish than if you come up with something shiny and new. And this is partly, I guess, because these new methods are going to get cited a lot more than any sort of um, incremental improvement. However, you find if you look in sort of the phylogenetics literature, that's, that's mostly incremental improvements. You know, we, we're in, still inferring phylogenies, we're just changing how we infer branch lengths and things like that. And so I think this might be something to really consider as we move into the next five years of, of methods in ecology and evolution. Do we want to just focus on the novelty? Or do we want to focus on getting the methods that we, we already know um, into a slightly more usable format sometimes? And then my final suggestion, which again in the original version had a wookie holding balloons, which was much cuter. So now they're just balloons floating around, um, is that we really need to incentivize this. If we want, if we want methods developers who are already really busy developing their methods and, and trying to have a career to do these extra things, then we really need to find ways of making it worth their while. Whether this be for funding, for pure methods research, rather than funding which is um, has to have some sort of empirical point to the question as well. 
um, or awards, or some kind of way of recognizing input to papers which doesn't just rely on where the paper was published and whether you're first or last author and these kinds of things. Um, so that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. So if anybody has any suggestions, uh, I'm sure I'm going to be happily discovered, or we can definitely um, have a chat about this later in the wider reception. So thank you very much. Thanks for bearing with the, uh, the microphone uh, function. Uh, so, do you have any questions from Natalie? From, yeah. um, do you think it's another good argument for like the reproducible research thing that if people are um, submitting annotated scripts, then you have another way of checking? How they were checking the like assumptions and the new methods and things like that. Yeah, no, that would sound completely sensible to me. I think I think all of these things end up being quite interlinked. This sort of idea of reproducible research and you know making sure that you've, you've taken into account the statistical assumptions and things like that. So uh, yeah, no, that, that definitely would would make sense. But then I guess you've got to find a balance between giving people too many things to do in order to get published and actually um, improving the way things are moving. Any questions? So if you're, if you're advising a say, student or postdoc um, embarking on this kind of analysis for the very first time, um, you've just been collected a data set, just been told by a colleague or referee that they need to, to do something, what would your advice be for the very first thing that they need to do? <laughs> um, some reading, I guess, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. I, I, so I, I think jumping into R is actually quite a good way to start an analysis. I, I know I've said on there that it's not a great idea, but I think jumping in and then playing around with the, the analysis is a good idea. But then I think it's really important to see which papers have been cited in that R vignette and things in the help files and actually go away and read them. Um, and I think that's where the problems lie, is that people think, oh, okay, well, I understand what's actually going on, I've managed to get this method working, but then you have to go away and just check that your data actually meets all the assumptions if you're actually applying it correctly. I think 